We acknowledge that this event is taking place upon the traditional territories, the territories of the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations Confederacy, the Anishinaabe peoples of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, and before them, the Chinantan Nation, called the Neutral by the French and the Attawandaran by the surrounding nations. These people are the original caretakers, the peoples that lived on and intimately worked with these lands. We acknowledge that we have a responsibility to know and understand their heritage. The treaty that was signed for this territory is the Between the Lakes Treaty No. 3 of 1792, and further the deed referred to as the Haldeman Proclamation of 1784, which applies to the land six miles on either side of the Grand River, from the mouth to its source. We need to be aware of our role in these documents. We also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples upon this land. We acknowledge that we have an obligation to learn to live wisely together on this land. A few examples. <laughs> I, I, when this topic came up, Brian said, can you do a story, can you do a talk for that? Yeah, we do it on maybe family-owned businesses. Well, you go back a hundred years, every business in Brantford was family owned. And then I thought, well, I, be I better do ones that are just two generations, at least two generations. And there was a hundred of them. Yeah. So I thought, maybe three generations, That's, that'll narrow it down. So I narrowed it down to a bunch. And even that, um, I literally could do two hours. A two-hour talk, because I've done two one-hour talks at different times. Phase one and phase two, they called it, um, for our group. That, um, And I still don't get them all. You can't. And how, there are some family businesses that you just can't make small. You can't tell the story small. Like, how do you tell Jimmy Conklin and Conklin Shows and uh, Conklin Garrett? How do you tell that story Small, you can't. I mean, it's impossible, really. Come back and tell it to us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> even even the ones I've got here, I've kind of highlighted a lot of the fun things about the company, the businesses, the family. But it's definitely not a hundred percent coverage of everything these guys did. But you'll, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, so I thought we'd start off by just having a little story tonight. So once upon a time, there were three brothers. Sam, Ted, and George. They, of course, were the Stedman brothers. We all know the Stedman brothers. In 1890, nine-year-old Sam Stedman decided he was going to start selling newspapers on the street. Nine years old, he was. And within a few years, he convinced his younger brothers, Edward and George, to join him. And they turned those humble beginnings into 300, a multi-million dollar business, 350 stores that were in small towns and big cities all across Canada. And it all started with the little guys selling papers. Back then, there was two local papers. One was the Expositor, which supported the liberal views of people around town. And the Courier, which promoted the conservative cause. Now look at these guys. Do these guys not look like they belong in Hell's Kitchen in New York? <laughs> They're going to be like, buy our paper. This guy here particularly. Buy my paper or I'll kill you. <laughs> and as fate would have it, shortly after the, the three brothers, they were setting up little newsstands on a three, what they said were the three busiest corners downtown. So my guess is it was Market and Deleuze, Market and Colburn, and perhaps Queen and Deleuze. And there was a murder trial in Woodstock where it was kind of, everybody loved it because it was two kind of upper crust Englishmen. One was a con man, one was a guy trying to buy land, and they, one, he ended up killing him. When the one gentleman killed the other fellow, sent a telegram to the guy's father saying, yeah, this is a great deal, send 500 pounds right away. Anyway, they caught him. The trial went on for a long time. He was finally executed, but the paper the papers covered it in great detail every day, so that Stedman's were selling papers like there's no tomorrow. And they, so soon enough, though, they, after a few years, they wanted to set themselves apart from everybody else. 
So they thought we'd sell national newspapers. And the national papers at that time were the Globe, the Mail, and the World. And they were all printed in Toronto. And Sam wrote to them, made a deal that he could have distribution rights for Brantford and South for these papers. He said, great, just ship, send them to Brantford. And they said, well, a train doesn't come to Brantford in the morning. We don't have a train there. You're going to have to, the closest one is Harrisburg, which is the other side of St. George. So every morning, 4 o'clock, teenage Sam would rent a horse and a wagon, take the wagon at 20 after 4. He knew he had to leave no later than that, drive to Harrisburg, pick up all the newspapers, and come back. And then they were selling that day's newspapers, uh, national papers, which nobody else was doing in town. So they kind of cornered the market on all of that. Eventually, they needed a place to put all these papers that they would bring, because they were selling more and more. Every morning, Sam would go out with his wagon. But they rented a room over a butcher shop on Colbert Street. And then eventually, a few years later, they thought that a storefront would be a good idea. So they rented a building. And then eventually, they thought, we're going to buy a building. But when they wanted to rent this building here, the building, I don't know exactly where it was, but it was on Colbert Street. And they said, the landlord said, you guys are just kids. You can't, you can't, like teenagers, you can't afford the rent. And he said, yeah, he said, uh, I'll rent you the building, but I need two years rent up front. Amount to $1,800, and Sam wrote a check. <laughs> and the guy's like, oh, okay, you're going to get the money, I'll, I'll rent you the building. Eventually, they bought out a stationary business at 160 Colbert Street, and the first Edmund bookstore was born. And... Uh, that's a great looking store, isn't it? Look at the ceiling. I love the ceiling, the tin ceiling. So they were at 160 Colbert, which is right here. That's Stedman's. Now this is obviously uh, an early picture. They were here for 30 years. And in 1942, they moved down to this building, which is the building we all know where it was. And any of you who are old enough to remember Stedman's bookstores in Brantford, that's where they were. This is interesting. Here's, a, here's a, a receipt from Stedman Brothers for a Mr. Foster at the courthouse. Three months subscription to the Globe, $1. Oh, wow. <laughs> Paid in advance, by the way. Of course. <laughs> they soon started manufacturing their own stationery with their store. They started making their own stationery. They started expanding into postcards, souvenir books, Christmas cards, and the first location was over top of the Hex Carriage Company. And some of you may have been in that building, if you're old as Andy and I. <laughs> that building ended up becoming the Paramount Theater. Across, that now is where coffee culture is, right on the corner. Or whatever. It's called Fridays now. I think. Friday, yeah. Anyway, that building's gone, but that's where it was. Um, but they, were, they rented rooms up there, and they were doing all their business there. And then. Now, in 1915, they bought the old former Carri uh, Collegiate Institute building on George Street, which is now, a, that location is now a park next to Central School. Um, but that was our first uh, Collegiate Institute. They became the company headquarters, and they, they combined their, their, uh, their businesses of manufacturing their cards and their postcards and their things. And... Uh, they combined them, and Sam became the chairman of the company, and George became the president. They started franchising stores all across the country, soon having locations from coast to coast. In 1924, they moved the operation, the head office to Toronto, and Sam said, nothing to do with Brantford, it's just absolute economics of being in Toronto made it so much more sense. Ruth? That a particular area there where that school is held the first cemetery in Brantford. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was a, that's a great story, isn't it? That's another little soft shoot. The central school was built on an old graveyard. They didn't bother to dig up the bodies, they just took all the way to the headstones and built the school anyway. They eventually exhumed them in 1981, I think, when they built the third central school. But getting back to the Stedmans, in 1913, just before the brothers combined their manufacturing businesses with their retail business, Sam married Jessie Cockshut Kipax. Now, Jessie, you can tell by her middle name, 
she was, her mother was Mary Cockshut, and Jesse was one of those people that could call Ignatius Cockshut grandpa. Um, Sam probably called him Mr. Cockshut, but I don't know that for a fact. But their pastel postcards took off like wildfire because it was, this was not long after home delivery uh, mail service started happening all over the country. And Brantford in around 1900, uh, but within the next 10 years, everybody was getting home delivery. Well, postcards were just the thing. Everybody wanted them. And this is a book uh, that you can now buy for collectors. You can buy, look at that, 6,500 different postcards that they, that they made. The postcard craze swept the country around at this time. It had the Stedman selling 400,000 postcards every year. Uh, now that wasn't just their store, obviously they were selling through their, all, all their operation. But 400,000 cards a year. And this is an example of a few of them. Um, he did local scenes from everywhere they had stores. So they had, this is, these are Brantford, that's a, a train station, that's Colburn Street looking east from Queen Street. <clears throat> There's our Carnegie Library. There's Mohawk Lake, when you could actually swim in it instead of walking on it, like you do today. Um, it's, uh, it was a wonderful thing. Then, but then, see, they also had like the English Bay entrance to Stanley Park, so uh, you know their stores out in the West Coast would have that kind of a thing. They had the, the old City Hall in Toronto, which is still there, but not the City Hall anymore. 1962, the business was sold to Gamble Scogmo of Minneapolis, and um, Stedman's bookstore, Brantford store, was closed in 1988. But as well as the chairman of Stedman, Sam also served as an alderman on city council for three years. You can see Stan right there. And for a time he was president of Oven, Brantford Oven and Rack, and he also served as vice president of Slingsby Manufacturing. He passed away in 1965 at the age of 84. But his daughters, Mary, Ruth, and Margaret, followed in their father's footsteps. Mary worked for McClellan Stewart in Toronto for a number of years, returned to Brantford to manage the Brantford Bookstore from 1950 to 1974. She was also a director of the Sam Stedman Foundation, which she founded shortly after her father's passing, which is still going and still giving away money every year. Mary passed away in 2014, the age of 92. But she made sure the Samuel Stedman Foundation would keep going. Stedman Community Bookstore, which is part of Laurier. The three sisters, uh, Mary went to the university and said, we think you should have a bookstore. And they said, we, well, we don't have money to pay for it. So each of the sisters did be, uh, cost up for $250,000 each. Made a donation to the Laurier and they named the bookstore uh, the Stedman Community Book. So now, I don't know how much regular book stuff is in there anymore. I think it's pretty much all books. Laurier books and Laurier stuff, which is fine. Um, but it serves its purpose. There's the old street from the 1920s. That's the exact same location today. I kind of like the old one, but <laughs> <laughs> this is clean, no question. Can't go anywhere without talking about the Brantford Plow Works, which we all knew as Cockshuts. James Cockshut was the guy who started it. Everybody thought that it was Ignatius Cockshut started Cockshut Plow Company, but it was his son, James G. Cockshut, he began in 1877. And he started on a, they, they built this little plant right here down on the canal, on, which is now basically the corner of, uh, Market Street and Icon Drive, parking lot for the casino now. But, uh, and the reason, I'll tell you how I, how I twigged this to fit into the multi-generational. This, this is an interesting story. Name was changed to the Bradford, from the Bradford Plow Works to the Cockshut Plow Company in 1882 when they uh, became incorporated. And you can see the original building, if you go back, you can see the original building, you see how it had the, the, the shaped roof. And you can see here where they've taken that roof off and they put an addition on the side of it. But one model that became so popular 
and when they opened it, they considered it was the plow that opened the West. And unfortunately, James died in 1885 from tuberculosis a few months before his sulky plow received the patent, but he did, they did have that. And it was a piece of marvel, I guess. Um, the company became so busy that capacity was increased over the years, and you can see they built buildings, they tore buildings down, they added stuff. Here's the original building right here. And this is the old, what became Victoria Bridge. Now the parking garage all along here. Um, but this building kept getting bigger and longer and moving around and doing all kinds of stuff. They finally outgrew all that and they moved down to uh, Mohawk Street. And uh, they became one of the largest agricultural implement producers in the world, as you know. The company uh, remained in the family's control until the 1960s when it was finally purchased by an American company and turned into white farm equipment. But the presidents, here's, this is funny, not funny, this is interesting. James Kaksha, president from 1877 to 1885 when he died. William F. Uh, w. F. Kaksha took over in 85 for three years, ran it after his brother died. And W.F. brought his father in as president, as vice president of the company. So there's two generations. I got, I got the two. <laughs> he did it for three years, then went to his next brother, Frank Kaksha. Frank ran it for, from 1888 to 1911, so over 20 years. All the same generation so, so far. Then the youngest brother, Harry Kaksha, took over from 1911 to 1921, then he became the lieutenant governor. He took a year off and he said, I'm going to make my vice president, who happened to be a man by the name of George Wedlake, who was the mayor of Brantford at the time. He said, I'm going to make him the president while I get my feet firmly planted as lieutenant governor. That was, and then George Wedlake went and had a heart attack and died. He was in, you know, in office as a mayor. He did, and, uh, so Frank, so Harry came back and ran the company from 1922 as lieutenant governor as well, but 1922 to 1934. This is only this is same family, same generation. Then Gordon Cockshut, the son of Frank Cockshut. Finally, we get to a third generation. <laughs> uh, Gordon Cockshut was the one who maneuvered them all through the war years. Um, you know, made sure that the uh, Kaksha uh, airplane division they, uh, was all up and running. The war effort, they did a huge, I could talk for two hours on what they did for the war effort, um, but we got to move on. What but, years did he run it? I'm sorry? What years did he He ran it from 1934 to 1960. So 26 years he was the president. There they are there, and there's George Wedlake here. He was only, again, he was only there for a year. But, they, but the family, I'd say one generation of people ran up until, like right from here to here, and then when uh, Gordon came in in 1934. Um, but they ran it for like almost, almost 90 years um, as one family. Just brother after brother after brother. Interesting story. I don't know if some of you know this guy, this, this, this family or not. The George Watt family. Incredible story. I had, didn't really know much about him until I started doing some research. This particular building is on the corner of King and Deluzzi. So if you were standing, my, if I was taking that photo today, my back would be to the OK tire on the corner. Um, Kentucky Fried Chicken would be over here, um, and uh, this little building right here. So is the building still there? That building went, got taken down. That uh, this building is gone. That's this building lot. got taken down because that was Angus Jewelers. <laughs> believe it or not, not then. Um, the building that's pictured is the parking lot next to the expositor building. That is the parking lot that is next to the expositor building. It looks like corner. it also includes the, the uh, court building. The court building? No, no, this is no? Deluzzi. 
and King. It's a parking lot beside the Expositor oh, yeah. building. George Watt was born in Ireland. He moved to Montreal for a couple of years. He's trained as a ship's carpenter. He had no trouble finding work when he got here. 1854, he decided he was going to open a grocery store. And he had, he lived in Brockville for five years and had two sons, came with one, had two more. In 1954, he decided to open a grocery store, had a fourth son. Didn't work all the time, apparently. <laughs> His first store was on the corner of Culver Street and Market, which is now, well, the mall's there, but it was part of the, part of the Market Square. And you could rent um, a building, you could rent lots there to put a building on back then. They were trying to raise money to put up a city hall. Lots were 24 feet by 60 feet. They were $60 a year on Culver Street and only $30 a year on Delusie Street because Culver Street was the hipper. <laughs> His store was on the main floor and the family lived above the store where a fifth son was born. The original store burned down. The business moved around to a couple of different locations and ended up on Delusie Street between King and Queen where what eventually became built as the... Uh, uh, the Grand Bell Hotel, a lot of us remember that building. Well, that was originally built, that particular building was built by, um, for the uh, Pelion and Winery storage. But um, Anyway, he became more of a distributor than a retail jeweler. And then he bought this lot on the corner, King and Delusi, and built this warehouse. And he didn't do things small, this guy. James, James was George's second oldest son, and he became the president in 1910. Now, George had started in 1857, so he, he was the president from 1857 to 1910 when he died at like 92 years old. He stayed on as the president, working it up all the time. His, old, his eldest son, Thomas, was with the company, but he was a secretary treasurer and never became president, but stayed on then. Then another brother, James's other brother, uh, in 1921 took over as he was, he had been the vice president, and then became president when, George, when James packed it in. And then Charles, who was the son of Thomas, who was the uh, secretary treasurer, uh, he was, became the third generation to become the president of the company. And then Thomas' grandson, I don't know whether William was Charles' son or not, I think not. But William was Thomas Watt's grandson and the fourth generation to preside over the company. But here's some statistics about where these guys were. 1857, he and two other businessmen put up the money and paid to build Zion Church. And we need a church. Okay, here's the money. George served as a city councilor in 1877 and 78. And in 1878, they were the largest tea importers in this part of Canada, as well as becoming the largest wholesale supplier of sugar. With George many times writing checks, numerous times a month, in excess of $100,000 for sugar. Now his warehouse had to be reinforced. The floors couldn't just be wooden floors. The floors were built with railroad ties, all levels. Of the, of the building because the weight of the stuff that they had. They had everything you can imagine. They brought, they had raisins and they brought in dates and they brought in pork in barrels and they brought in sugar by $100,000 orders of sugar and it just stacks and stacks of that whole building. Yes? And which building was that? That was the one I showed you on the corner of the nice looking, the nice -looking building. That was their warehouse. Now, um, I can show you, I'm just going to tell you, just to go back right to there. You used to be able to take your wagons in here off Delusy Street, but because there was so much traffic coming and going, you had to take your wagons through the building and come out in the little alleyway and out onto King Street because there was so much, so much traffic in his, in his building. In 1886, the Ontario Albanac listed George Watt as having a credit rating of $50,000 and an excellent risk. 
In that same issue, Timothy Eaton was listed as having a $10,000 credit and a fair risk. So he was bigger than Timothy Eaton. George was elected mayor in 1894, but he donated the salary back to the city because they, he felt they couldn't really afford it. 1907, the city found themselves in trouble, so George gave them $70,000 to get over a hump, which they repaid him the next year. And he worked right up to the time of his death in 1910, uh, 86, not 90, yeah, 86 years old. But what a family. They were just incredible, just incredible. Like, and they, when the company, I mean, distri distribution of, of uh, food products changed when grocery stores started opening, like Dominion started opening, and Z Z Loblaws, and all these stores. They were bringing, they were supplying themselves with things. And his business just petered off, and so they closed it up, you know. Yes? So that building, if it was so heavily reinforced with, like, rail ties, would have been strong. Oh, yeah. So why did they tear down this? You need a parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that building when I was a kid. I remember that because it was next to my dad's store. I remember that building. I remember looking in, and it was all vacant. And they needed parking, and that, and that was, it was probably, I don't know what condition it was actually in by the time they tore it down, but uh, it was, uh, it was, they did take it down. It had, it had a fire one, at one point in it, and they changed the roof line because the fire had gone through the roof, so the peaks were gone, and it was a much more flat building at the time. But Another family business, the Digby family. Alfred, Alfred Digby, built it, uh, born in Ireland, came here, was appointed the surgeon of the Six Nations. He held that position until he died. He was, on, he was uh, elected to the first town council in 1847, served as the town's mayor for 48 and 49, 1848. He, he took his role seriously because during the first term on council, he moved the resolution that said, any member of this council who comes here drunk and acts like a fool will not be listened to. <laughs> <laughs> and it was carried, of course. Has it been rescinded? Yeah. I don't think it's ever been rescinded. I think you can't come drunk. <laughs> Dr. Digby bought a house at the corner of Market in Wellington, where the Bell Telephone building is now. His house faced Wellington Street, not Market Street, like the Bell Telephone building does. I'll show you a picture of it. It had been a Dr. Gilpin had built it, and it had been his family home and doctor's office. And it became the next, the doctor's office for the next three generations. He died in 1866. Alfred's son, James Digby, was born here in 1842, graduated McGill Medical School in 1862, so he was only 20 years old, too young to practice as a doctor. I think he had to be 21 or 25, I don't know, maybe. was it 21, Ruth, you know? I don't know. Yeah, but you had to, he was too young. So he went down to New York, ended up becoming a surgeon for the American Civil War, was in a number of, was at a lot of battles with the American Civil War, returned to Bradford at the end of the war in 1866 to take over his father's business when he died, and took over the house as well, continuing on in the Dr. Digby practice. He was at the town's, the town council's last mayor and it was the city council's first mayor when it became a city in 1877. He died in 1906. And his son, Reginald Digby, um, spent his entire 50-year career as a physician in Bramford, graduated a medical degree at McGill, same as his dad. The end of that, and he, he went off. He joined the, the uh, army during World War I, and at the end of the war, he returned to the medical practice that, at, and worked out of the family home on Wellington Street. He was also, uh, he died suddenly of a stroke. He, he actually um, lived just down the street on Wellington. He didn't live in the family home. That had just become a, a, a doctor's office at that point. And then Reg's son, Jim Digby, James Digby, I don't know if any of you know James Digby or knew him, a lot of people did in town, 
he was a great guy. Uh, he went to Ridley College and then went to McGill University like his father and his grandfather. Completed his training, did his residency in Toronto and returned to Brantford, continued to practice. Um, he became, he was, carried on the family business from, from his great grandfather. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but D-Wing at the hospital is named after the Digby family. That's why it's the D-Wing. And the little road that comes off of McMurray Street Hill there is, uh, um, Digby not Digby McMurray Street, it? It, yeah, but no, it's Elizabeth Street. Yeah. It's off Elizabeth Street. It's called Digby Drive, that little piece of driveway in there. Mm -hmm. Died in 2021, the age of 93, but he was an adventurer, this guy. He would go hiking and he rode, he flew a small plane all the way across Canada for fun. He took a, he went, he went skydiving in New Zealand and he mountain climbed in New Zealand and he went, his, uh, his daughter t said that he, just as an adventure, he went and learned how to build igloos in the Arctic one winter and lived, out, lived in the Arctic in, in the igloos for a couple of weeks. There's the Digby House on the corner of Wellington and Market. This would be the side of the Bell Telephone Building now. Mm -hmm. um, Market Street runs this way, and Wellington Street runs this way. There's another picture of the home there. And I guess anybody who was anybody, if they ever came to town, would be, they'd have a reception for them at the Digby House, you know. Is that building still there? No, it, no it, it got torn down when they built the Bell Telephone Building. So that was, it was demolished, of course. Ludlow Brothers, started in 1911 by Austin Ludlow, everybody knew his art, and his brother Charles. You see here, Ludlow Brothers, head to foot clothiers. Both men started out working for other businesses. Ott worked for Wilds and Quinlan for a while, and uh, Charles worked at a shoe store. They decided to open their own business, and they were selling boys' clothes, men's work clothes, anything that you, you needed to sell, but they operated their two businesses, their shoe business and their clothing business as two separate companies, even though they were side by side with a, with a doorway between the, the two stores. Was that on Street? That was on Deleuze Street, that's it, right there. And you can see um, this bowling alley got demolished and this building did too when they built the Sanderson, it was now the Sanderson Center. When the Temple Building got built in 1919, that bowling alley disappeared, which is a shame. We lost the bowling alley and gained a beautiful theater. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, you know, that's the only reason I showed this picture was to show you where it was in real. So they were right there where they always were for years. Now this guy, maybe I'm the only one, but does this guy here look like? Curly from the Three Stooges. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Larry from the Three Stooges. Larry, look at the fuzzy hair. Look at that. Tell me that's not Larry from the Three Stooges. Look at the people up here look at, watching the parade. When did they have elephants? <laughs> Who wouldn't want elephants? And every time the circus came to town, they would take the elephants, they unload all the animals from the train, they'd parade them down Market Street, make a left onto Deleuze Street, March them across the bridge and over into Cockshut Park, which was an agricultural park. Dad, they come see the circus, you know? My dad said when he was little, they used to, they used to go down Erie Ave, and, and they would be at par what's now Parsons Park. Yeah. That oh, yeah, they had, they were, wherever somebody would set up their circus, you know, yeah. depending on how big it was, I suppose. But you can see here at Ludlow's, again, right next to the Capitol Theater, which is, this is 1930. In 1942, they decided to stop selling boys' clothing and men's workwear, and then Ott retired, and uh, his son George took over. Funny, Ott retired, and he died like within a year of retirement when he left. But again, you can see Ludlow Brothers' clothing again right there. Then they doubled the size. In 1956, they went from this store to this and this store. This was the Capitol Bakery and Rosary Flower Shop, and they took it over expanded into a much bigger store, one side being shoes, one side being clothes. And we, that, and a lot of us remember that building downtown. 1966, George's son Don Ludlow, which I'm sure a lot of you know Don, 
been working part-time since the age of 10, started working full-time for his dad, became the third generation of the Lumbo family to work in the store. And then Don's son Greg, at age 12, started working in the store after schools and again 12 years old. I can relate to all that. I was 13 and I went to work for my dad. After school, joined the business in 2000, becoming the fourth generation of families. And they, in, uh, 19, in 2002, they moved out of the downtown and they built a new store on Linden Road. But there's the four generations of Ludlow's. Yeah. And didn't they change? Because I, I remember they sold women's clothes as well. I don't remember them ever reading that at the They never sold women's clothing. Uh, I don't they know. They, next they, door. Next door. Oh, Patricia's. Patricia's. That's not Patricia's. down. Yeah. Well, not Patricia's, but they sold women's clothes. I don't clothes think they ever did. No. Oh, it's always love those men's wear. Where were the downtown at fire? Originally? Sorry? Yeah, where were they from originally? I don't know. I don't know where Ott came from. Weren't they in St. George there in the hotel? Um, for a little bit too. For a, a no, bit. I don't remember that, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. <laughs> I I, I don't like know. Another family business from Brantford, J. H. Young and Sons. This is the, you can see these two buildings. This is Jones and Company Opticians, exact same building, J. H. Young and Sons, 86 Colbert Street. They bought it in 1900. James Young bought the opticians that was located there and turned it into a jewelry store. But also, uh, they were an optician and jeweler. A lot of them were in the 1900s. Uh, jewelers and optometrists shared the business lots of times because the tools were very similar. So it just seemed to be one of those businesses that stayed married for a long time. Uh, Julie and opticians. And that's J. H. Young. They were and uh, James and his wife Matilda, sometimes called M uh, Millie. Were they lived above the store with their four children, Charles, May, Leonard, and Ward. Some of you may remember them. Charlie entered the business as a jeweler. Uh, he was the first of the second generation, and he worked until 1972. I'll tell you a funny story. Charlie was very frugal, is the way we put it. Charlie would come at the end of the day when they, I guess they were counting the money or doing whatever they do at the end of the business day back then. I was just a kid. Charlie would park his Cadillac in front of my dad's store and then walk down the alleyway into their business. And he came in one day and he takes his dime out of his pocket and he says, if my parking meter runs out, he put that dime in there for me, wouldn't you? He does, puts it there. And he comes back, and the parking meter hadn't run out, and he came in the store, and he looks at it. Takes the dime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he went, uh, wasn't going to spend the dime if he didn't have to. <laughs> and then Leonard, the Charles' younger brother, joined, and he worked until 1978. And then Ward, who was the youngest son, joined. He was an optometrist. And they all worked together. And their mother, Tilly, helped whatever she could. In 1969, the optometry part of J.H. Young's branched out to a separate location right across the street. As, and then eventually became Wells Young Zach Optometrists that are now on William Street. But it was uh, Wells and Young, I think, that moved across. Uh, he, they had a partnership. And Ward worked for them, for his son. Leonard's son, Robert, followed in his father's footsteps and started working uh, in 1948. And then he passed away in 1978 um, from cancer. But Robert was a third generation, and he married Betty. They had four children, David, Diane, Paul, and Graham. After Robert's passing, Betty owned the business. Uh, she operated it until her passing in 2009. Some of you may remember Betty. She was a bit of a force. In the fourth and fifth generations, there's Paul and Graham and David uh, and Diane are the three, are Robert's four kids. Vanessa is Paul's daughter and Lauren is David's daughter. And Lauren and Vanessa are the fifth generations. They're both working in the store now. 
uh, Vanessa went to California, became a gemologist and a goldsmith, and she's working, following her in her, in her dad Paul's footsteps there. And Lauren is a sales associate there now. So there they are, five generations, 124 years, uh, one family business. It's amazing. I think they are, without a doubt, the, lot, the oldest jewelry business, family-owned jewelry business in Canada. Where are they now? Where are they? They're, well, I'm sure. Nearby Ludlow's. They're right beside Ludlow's. Oh, okay. On <laughs> um, yeah, on Linden Road. Yeah. Yeah. They they uh, they bounced around. They moved out of their store in '86, went into the mall for a few years, then like the downtown Eaton Mall. Then they went to the Linden Park Mall for eight or ten years, and then built the building here in conjunction with Ludlow's. With Ludlow's, they own the building. The young jewelry chain, though, are they related to that? No, uh, no, no. no. Young, the other Young's jewelers are not. This is why this has been very carefully marketed as J.H. Young. Uh, and, uh, but, the great, great guys. <coughs> Sorry about this, Bob. <laughs> We're going to do a little Top Scott Drugs. 1868, a young man named Samuel Tapscott got off a stagecoach in what was then the town of Brantford with its wooden sidewalks and its dirt roads, and he was going to open a drugstore. And this is the corner of, of Colburn, I'm sorry, Dalhousie and Market. This is what the building looks like on the corner of Colbert, this is Colbert, the Lucy Street ran this way and Market Street across it. And there you can s hardly see it, but it says Tapscott right there. And he secured a premises there at 24 Market Street across from the town hall and the town square. Now, Bradford's population in 1868 was around 6,000 people. Now, this is not 1868. This is uh, probably around just over after 1900, because you can see here, this guy here is a, looks like a postman, and they weren't around until just after 1900. But I use it as an old picture. This is, you can see their building right here. That little strip of storage was right there. Yeah, this is Market Street. Again, dirt streets and wooden sidewalks. And um, it was, there was 6,000 people, and there was only one drugstore, and ten years later, Mr. Tapscott, there was, there was four druggists and one drugstore. Ten years later, Mr. Tapscott was the only one of that group that was still in business. And an early advertising slogan of his was, buy your drugs at Tapscott's, they'll be right. <laughs> an interesting note with Tapscott's, they had the first business phone in Brantford. They had a phone that went from their drugstore to Dr. Digby's house. And Dr. Digby could pick up the phone and say, I need an order of whatever. They'd get it ready, put a little kid on a bicycle, down the street he'd go and deliver the prescription to Dr. Digby. So that was, and people used to go, they'd take one person, would go to Tapscott, and one person would go down there just so they could talk to each other on the phone. <laughs> that was such a novel thing. Before you move the picture, You'll notice those are wooden sidewalks? Yeah. Yeah, they are. Wooden sidewalks. And probably a lot of horse manure. <laughs> Everybody says, oh, I'd love to live back there. No, you wouldn't. The, fly, <laughs> the flies and the smell and the thing. Ruth? The other thing is, are the, the poles with so many crops. Yeah, look at this. Yeah. So this has to be early 1900s. And you can see the, the policeman here with the bobby hat on. That was a style back in 1910 or whatever. Samuel, Samuel, oh, hang on, there was one thing I could tell you was, Samuel Tapscott got married and had a son, Henry, in 1910. Samuel Pat Tapscott passed away in 1906. You can see there's a bottle from the Tapscott drug stores. And his son, Henry, successfully carried on management of Tapscott drugs. And, uh, that bottle. Hmm? That bottle. Is that part of your personal display? Or no, I don't have that. That's not mine. Do you know whose that is? I don't know whose that is. Oh, okay. I wonder if maybe it was part of the collection. No. Yeah, Henry Tapscott opened a second location on Area Ave in 1923. 
it would have been this part. This part wouldn't have been on there then. <laughs> and it wouldn't have been heads or tails gaming. Yeah. It would have just been the red brick building, is all it would have been. <laughs> that was Tapscott Drugs. Was it then that that later became Standard Drug? Yeah, yeah, it did. It did. You're right, it did, Lori. And then this location on William Street, and you can see the curved doorway that's been bricked over. And if you see buildings around town that are on a corner and they've got a, a corner doorway, mm -hmm. chances are that was built as a store. That's what people did with, you know, could, they were butcher shops, conf confectionery stores, or whatever you, they call them now. But, you know, they were just the general stores for the community, the area. I mean, people didn't have cars. They would just walk down and get what they needed from their grocer and stuff. And, these, and those buildings all had corner doors on them. Both of these locations were closed in the 1940s from Tapscott. And this is, you can see, this is our old city hall here. There's the CIBC bank, and you can see, you can't really see it, but there's a, right there it says drugs, um, and that's Tapscott's, still there. And then this is Marcus from the other corner, remember Woolworth? Tapscott's right there, you can see the drugs, and then right next to Agnes Surpass, another Brantford company, next to Kitchen Overalls, another Brantford company. And just down the street to White's Bakery, you know. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you see, there you can see, there you can see Tap, Tap Scott's right there. Yeah. Tap Scott's, and again, 24, there they are, still there. Henry Tap Scott was very well respected in Bradford, but he passed away in 1951 at the age of 74. And his son took over, Samuel, named after his grandfather, I guess, um, followed in his family business. And he worked alongside his dad for a little bit, but his dad died in 1951, and then Sam Tapscott, the son, died four years later. And the business was then bought by Mr. Hugh Christine. Uh, but there they were. They were listed in the city directory in 1970, 102 years after it opened, <coughs> still located in that original location on Market Street. 102 years. One's one family drugstore there. And of course you can't not talk about the Forbes brothers. It, this is a kind of an interesting, uh, a little bit of an interesting uh, reason that we included them other than the fact they were three generations. But it was two brothers, two brothers, two brothers, the three generations. Russ, Russ and Stan left Detroit. They worked for the Ford Motor Company and apparently Russ was a personal assistant to Henry Ford, and they moved to Tilbury, and they started selling Ford cars and parts in Tilbury. And in 1924, they opened a Ford dealership in Brantford uh, at 303 Culver Street on the corner of Clarence. Now it's a, I think it's a, a tire store, it was an auto glass store for a little while, a little wee place there. That was their original location. I don't have any photos of it. Then they built this in 1926. They put up a building up on Darling Street, right behind the Sanderson Center. That's now all part of the parking lot behind the Sanderson. This is an older picture of the 1926. And then here in 1932, they added a service station. Beside it, there's the building here. There, this is the Sanderson Center right here. This is the old Bodega Hotel on the corner. This is Market Street, and this is Darling Street, or uh, Darling Street. This is their building here. They added a used car lot here. You can see Wellington Church is still there. The Foresters Building is right there, now owned by Vacano. Had a tour of it the other day. They've done a beautiful tour. They're, gonna, they're renovating the old inside of it. They're keeping the exterior all the same as it was. Um, but that just shows you where they were. They took up pretty much that whole block. This now, all of this now from here back is all parking lot. This is all behind the Sanderson. Yes. There's the, there they are in 1937. And I don't know if any of you can tell which guy there is the complaints department. <laughs> Anybody know? I'll show you. A little close up. 
How about that guy? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's cocked. It's cocked. I don't. It's, I'm like, what? And I, I figure he must be in the complaint department. There he is, right there. Um, but there's uh, there's Stan and Russ right there, the two original Forbes brothers. And their 85 horsepower cars, the V8. 1940, Sam left Brantford and Stan to become the Dodge DeSoto dealer in Kitchener. And Stan's sons, Bruce and Tom, took over after Sam, after Russ left. And you can see here's a there they are. There's there's Bruce and Tom. 1951. Now look at how many of these guys are mechanics. Like from here all the way across here, all the way in the back row. I, and, and these technicians here in the white coats, these, it, I mean that was just a fact of the time in the 50s. You were fixing your cars all the time. That's what they did. I think half their business was the repair business, you know, selling your car and then fixing it for you. Where's the guy with the gun? The guy with the gun. <laughs> He's not there. Well, he, it could be this guy. He's got his hands behind his back. <laughs> it's hard to tell. I only put this sign in, this picture in, because it shows you this is, in 1955, they switched to Chevrolet, Chevrolet dealers. Henry Ford used to come and visit the original Stan and Russ. He used to come to Brantford, get off the train, come to their store. He called them my boys. <laughs> He'd come there. And... Uh, so Henry Ford used to come to Brantford back in the early days when they when they had. I mean, it was he was he was wanting to look after his dealerships, you know. Um, anyway, they became a Ford dealership or a Chevy dealership. Here's an interesting 1960 ad for a Biscayne two door. Twenty nine hundred dollars. Now I want to show you something here. There's a or you could buy a Corvair 1960. Or you could get this receipt. To Mr. Andy Angus, my dad oh. bought a 1966 Chevy Biscayne for $2,945. He got $545 for his 1958 Chrysler sedan that he traded in. And, uh, but he got some extras. He got windshield washers. <laughs> he got backup lights. He got a rear view mirror. He put seat belts front and back. And a, whatever a panel cover is. I'm not exactly sure, but... He got optional equipment on that car. <laughs> My dad liked that stuff. They then, in 1972, they moved down here, which is now uh, Market Street. It's now the Convention Center down on Market Street South. And Tom retired that same year. And then Bruce's sons, Jim and Bob, entered the business. Um, a lot of you, anybody who had anything to do with Ford Brothers at all knew Jim or Bob. And they had, they were there, they had 90 years. Stan and Russ started in 1921. And it's interesting, when they moved out to Linden Road, where they are now, it's now Strickland's, um, there was no, no street numbers along there. So they asked the post office, could we have 19-21 as oh. our address? <laughs> and they said, sure. So that's why, that's why Strickland's is at 19 -21. 19-21 Linden Road. 90 years, three sets of brothers. Jim and Bob sold the business in 2011 to Strickland's. But that was interesting. Two brothers, two brothers, two brothers. You know, Family-owned business. None of their kids ever wanted to have anything to do with the car business, apparently. So. This is, I'm going to tell you about Bartles, and this is going to be kind of the end. Of, this is the last one I'll tell you about. This is a little longer. But we all think of Bartles as Bartles. We all know Bartles' store. Well, Jesse Bartles was born in Norfolk and immigrated as a child with his family in 1863. And, but Branford's relationship with the Bartle family really started with his uncle Francis Bartle, who managed or owned the King's Hotel. It wasn't the King's Hotel. He was the, he was the proprietor of the King's Hotel. The King's Hotel was owned by two sisters, uh, the last name of King, I believe. Hence the name. Uh, Where was that? Some, okay, I'll show you. It was right there. Oh. This is when it was the Red Onion. <laughs> Not that I was. 
I was never in there. It's now, the, it's now the gentleman's club, but this was the front door. You see, this, this, this part right here was the front door of the hotel. And if you go back, you can see... Oh, man, um, I guess I spent that place. <laughs> you can see the three windows here. Those three windows you can see are here. And then it became a gentleman. It became the Red Onion. And the Red Onion, then it became Seductions, and then it became uh, the it gentleman's Saint club. It was St. Julian's house at one oh, time. Oh, St. Julian, yeah, of course. Yeah, Before the Red Onion, it was yeah. St. Julian. Our, our, was it the strip part? Was St. Julian's, I think, and, and the Red no. Onion was the tavern. No. I think or the Red the Onion, I don't, I'm not sure the Red Onion didn't have girls, I'm not sure. Well, they did have girls. <laughs> <laughs> well, we Moving didn't on. that place. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jesse decided he was going to become a builder, and he went up to work for Promar Construction in Brantford, a big company then. Set up shop in his own business at Darling Street, got married, had four sons. And six daughters. Again, didn't work all the time. <laughs> his eldest son, Sidney, followed, uh, eventually followed his father into business. And two of his younger sons, Art and Ken, went on to operate Bartles Confectionery. But, and during all this, Jesse went on building some of the, the, the stuff in the city that you want to imagine. They, this is a, just a little piece of what Jesse Bartle built. He built Grace Church Rectory. He built the Parish Hall in 1918. And you can see, it says right there, Jesse Bartle, builder, right underneath there. 1918, he built that. He built this house, the Breathour House. Some of you may recognize it today as Beckett Glaze. It was, it was called the Livingston House because Mr. Breathour built it and when he died, his daughter got married to a man by the name of Livingston. He gambled away all the money, unbeknownst to her, all of it. Uh, he died suddenly, and she ended up having to sell the house and move into the YWCA, which was just over here. She lived out the last 30 years of her life or something, living in the Y. Grew up in the lap of luxury, but the sins of the gambler. He also built the House of Refuge down on Mount Pleasant Street, which is now about where uh, John Noble Home is. But it was called the Home for the Aged. It was called the House of Refuge. It expanded over the years. You can see this part right here. It went this way and it went back this way. And Jesse built this. It got torn down in the 1960s, I think, didn't it, Ruth? Something like that. Um, it was a pretty raggedy looking place by the time it came down. But Ignatius Cockshit built that, paid for that. But see, there's the cornerstone, Jesse Bartle built 1900. He built King Edward School, which was a Huron Street School. Uh, it was re renamed to, to King Edward School. Closed in 1980, then had a suspicious fire and burned down in 1981. Some of you know, may know what that was. It's up behind um, Parsons Friday Park. Night dances. Yeah, Parsons Park down off Erie Ave, just up at the top of the hill. Um, Emily sorry. Street. Tootla Park. Park, sorry. Emily sorry. Street, I think. No, it's, it was on. It was right at the end of yeah, right at the end of Huron Street. Yeah, but it was it faced Emily Street. Yeah. But it had two kind of doors to it. Yeah, he built this house, the Dufferin House, which is owned by for Harry Cockshit. Um, that is now. The condos on Dufferin Ave. Mm -hmm. uh, that, so it became St. John's College for a while. Got kind of in pretty rough shape. Tore it all down. Let's tear it down. He also built the Scarf Estate on Aber Road. And the story goes, according to Peter Bartle, that Jesse was building this and taking extreme care, but Mrs. Scarf would change her mind. <laughs> She said, you know, that staircase should be wider. Can you tear that out and do it again? <laughs> he got so mad with her right near the end of all the little beautiful wooden details that he was putting in the house, at their request, of course, that um, he turned the work over to, he hired uh, Schultz Brothers Construction to finish 
the house because he couldn't stand working for Mrs. Scarf anymore. Is that still there? It is that's still there. Peter Vacano lives in that house. That's right next to Glenhurst. Oh, yeah. But you can't see it because of the landscaping. Yeah, yeah oh, it's yeah. hard to see. You can see it from the <laughs> upper parking lot of yeah. the Glenhurst if you go up there and look over the fence. If you look through the fence, you can see their swimming pool. <laughs> Actually, yeah, Peter. Peter, Actually, man, you know what? In the way. I'll bet you Peter would take anybody through there on a minute's notice if you asked him. Seriously? Oh, yeah. Um, can you arrange that? <laughs> I might be able to, uh, actually. That's, yeah. We're going to take advantage of that. This is the original Barnum store. store. Oh. So this is where we're getting to now. Jesse's son, Sidney, bought this confectionery store from a Mrs. Oliver and her daughter back in 1935. And it was on St. Paul's Ave. You can see the, the railroad tra the streetcar tracks. Look at that, all these. Look at all the housing up here on on uh, Lions Ave. Uh, Sid Sid ran the store for five years, and then uh, after he bought it, and then Jesse's wife, which is Sid, Sid's mom, took over the business around 1940. So they had this little confectionery store. And in after the war in 1946, Art and Ken. Art bought the business and Ken bought in as a partner a year later because Art was off serving in the Air Force and Ken was uh, running the Cockshut Aircraft Division or parts of, part of it. He was managing part of that. He was, uh, he was in town for all the war. They look like and this is Art in front of the store in the late 1940s, a little wee store like that. The Barnum's Confectionery, finally. And they changed the signs a few times. And the original building was replaced next door in 1949, and then this was torn down, and they added an addition here. This is where the original building was. You can see the old hospital across the street. That, was, that building's gone now, that house. But they became known for their cellophane wrapped gift baskets. How many, I don't know how many of you guys ever bought a cell. You go into the hospital and see somebody, you got to go into Barnum's and buy a... They started selling them for $1.50, these baskets. Of, and they, then by the 80s, they were $25. Uh, in 1965, Barnum's bought the first ice making machine, ice cube machine. And they started selling bags of ice. It was a new, it was a new thing. People were... In, in what year? 1965. I mean, it wasn't the very first, the first one in Bradford that did commercially. You could go buy a bag of ice for your party. 1980, at the International Villages, in one week, they sold 10 tons of ice cubes in one week to the villages. They had to hire a refrigerated tractor trailer to park in the parking lot behind the store, and they would fill it up. They'd work all night, every night, filling up this trailer full of bags of, or green garbage pails full of ice. And they would then put them in the delivery van and drive them around and dump them into all the containers and all the things. Ten tons of ice in one week. Where was that relative to the Rexall? It is the Rexall. That is That's the Rexall. Rexall. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're going to see in a minute. Art suffered a heart attack in 1972 and retired from the business. And that's when Ken convinced his son Paul to leave his civil engineering job in Toronto and become a partner in the business. Oh. And Paul's like, but, but, but. He's like, come on, son, I need you. Anybody who's been involved in the family business knows what, how that is. <laughs> so Paul came back. This is Paul's wife, Diane, here. I went to high school. I went out through public school with Diane. Got to know Paul very well. Paul got his first pay packet. He paid everybody in cash back then. Paul got his first pay packet, opened it up, and says to his dad, you know I used to get more money in mileage every week from my other job. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Paul ran the business for years. I mean, this is just some of the pictures of them back in the 60s, 70s. One of the things to mention with Bartles, too, was their lunch counter. Yep. Yeah, yeah I don't have a... Yeah. I mean, the yeah. picture of Ken that uh, was leaning on the lunch counter. Yeah. <laughs> the hamburger. My daughter worked there for, through high school and worked with them, and they were just wonderful people to the kids, and she just loved their hamburger. You know, I remember as a little kid, we lived on, we grew up, I grew up on Wells Ave for the first eight years, which is, runs between Terrace and Dundas. 
And I used to walk over to Bartles, I'd save up my 10 cents allowances and I'd save up four of them. And I would go over there and I would buy a matchbox toy. They were little die cast cars. I mean, now you can buy them for $1.45. Mm -hmm. They were 39 cents back then. These little matchbox toys. Yeah. And they used to go in and I'd ask him, could you turn on the lights downstairs? He'd turn on the lights and I'd go down and look in the little case they had, <laughs> decide which little car I was going to buy a month from now because that would really have enough allowance. <laughs> but I remember there was, and like you say, the lunch counter, the smell of it, you go in, it was just great. Mm -hmm. And he had a lot of toys and so on Christmas time. Huh? Yeah, oh yeah, they had a big toy business at Christmas. Paul ran the store until 1991, which is a lot longer ago than I thought, <laughs> 30 years ago. Uh, when he got an offer to sell it to Dell Pharmacy. This is what it looked like in 1990. The original store was here, then they built this, and then they tore down the original and built an addition a few years later there. So, but he sold it to, and that's how it looks today. Rexall. But, the, but really it was three generations of people Paul was the last one. Uh, and that kind of business had just kind of run its course, I think, you know? I don't know what else to say. Still a busy course. But that, I'm going to say, is the end and I, because um, I have in other stories, but we'd be here all night. Um, <laughs>